Thank you. Thanks, Dimitri. So, um, as many of you know, on Friday we will be uh, organising a scientific session celebrating uh, 60 years of Pierce Coleman. Um, to some extent, this conference so far has been a birthday party without the birthday boy. Um, and I know that a number of speakers, some of whom have already spoken, uh, have put in pictures and were, gonna, were making remarks that were particularly pertinent to Pierce, who for personal reasons, of course, has not been here so far. So I thought to capture that and the fact that uh, a number of the rest of us who are not speaking uh, also have maybe some memorabilia, pictures and things that they'd like to, demo, to, to show, uh, maybe very brief anecdotes that others would like to hear. Um, we're putting on a non-scientific session after the main program on Friday, so that'll be five o'clock here. So those of you who have got something you want to say, um, the point of being in here is if you've got pictures and things to illustrate, uh, I know there may be potentially um, uh, even more diverse ways of honouring Pierce, um, but I will allow that and your imagination to run wild. This is not intended to last into the early hours of the next morning. This is meant to be a relatively brief session, but an opportunity for those of you who've got things that you want to contribute that haven't fitted into the programme, or if they did, Pierce's absence has stolen some of the thunder from it. Please send me an email. We'll put the programme together at five, and the incentive for being brief is that there is... I hope, going to be a birthday cake. It may not be very big, um, but it will melt in this heat if the session goes on too long. So please send me an email uh, if you've got something you'd like to say, and I'll put together a little brief running order for that. Thank you. Okay, so with that, we go into transport. Our first speaker is our Cameron Benia uh, from ESPCI. Thank you. Okay, uh, let me begin by thanking the organizers, uh, Dimitri and Andre. Uh, for giving me the chance to come back to Trieste. Actually, yeah, it, it has been a long time, the first time I came when Pierce was beginning to run this, uh, this show in this beautiful place. So uh, I'm going to talk about Wittmann Francois in uh, WP2. Uh, the main uh, actor is Alexandre Javi, who did the measurements in the frame of his uh, PhD. Uh, so besides my group, actually, this all began with uh, a talk by Claudia Felser in KITP Santa Barbara last year. We had some nice theoretical input from the chairman of this session, Dimitri, and from Alaska Subedi. I'm going to refer to other stuff during my talk, which has been done all around the world in Tokyo, Yo Machida, measure thermal conductivity of black phosphorus. I will show a, a slide about this, and also some work in Rio de Janeiro uh, done by Valentina Martelli on a strontium titanate. So, thermal conductivity is very, uh, you know, many of you are not familiar with it, but conceptually it is as simple as electrical conductivity. Fourier's law is the equivalent of Ohm's law. It's something you expect in any diffusive medium where you can put, you know, under scrutiny what happens if you put a force. It could be electric field or a temperature gradient. If you have carriers of charge and entropy, you have uh, basically a linear response and you, have, you can measure it. Uh, and this is basically the, the root picture which is with us since the beginning of the 20th century. Now, ironically, the law of Wittmann and France was discovered 50 years before. 
And it is very simple. If you measure elements at room temperature and you look at the ratio of these two conductivities, this is what they discovered in 1850 something, uh, actually you come close to a number which is not exactly the same. You know, it's important to see that you have, it, at room temperature, it is an approximate law. You are not very far from one number which is of the order of 2.45. It took 50 years and the quantum revolution to, for people to understand what are these numbers. This is basically the Sommerfeld number with this pi 2 over 3, and the other guys are basically the quantum, the quantum of entropy, the Boltzmann constant, and the quantum of electric charge, the charge of electron. Now, the wiedmann franz law, one of the oldest law of physics, has been one of the most attacked law during the last 20 years for different reasons in different contexts. But all of them, maybe not all of them, but most of them has turned to be wrong. Uh, you know, uh, uh, to be honest, at this moment, we don't have any solid evidence that in any system, the wiedmann franz law is broken at zero temperature uh, for different reasons. And now, I'm going to talk about another aspect, but before going there, we know that wiedmann franz law should be valid or expected to be valid at zero temperature, but we know also that there is a finite temperature departure. At intermediate temperatures, as soon as you put some inelastic scattering, then the fate of heat transport and the fate of charge transport don't coincide. And uh, well, one simple way of thinking about it is that when you are measuring charge transport, you are looking at the momentum flow. And there is an angular filter, one uh, minus cosine theta, which means that you have, if you have a lot of small angle scattering, then that doesn't matter that much for charge transport, but that matters for heat transport, which is basically about the energy carried by particles. And you see, in the old school, like in, in Zeiman, uh, this is called horizontal versus vertical scattering. Uh, in the sense that in one case you change drastically the energy of the system and the other case you don't. And what is expected is a downward deviation. Okay, uh, and actually we have a good theory about this. If you look at electron phonon scattering, as you know at low temperature, this bloch grunison law gives you a T5 resistivity. Part of it is actually part of this large power law comes from the fact that as you cool down the system, most phonon scattering become small angle. So you have something which is not the familiar T cube law that you expect according to the uh, uh, Dubai picture. And uh, basically, the phase space for scattering for heat and charge are different. There is also a difference for electron electron scattering. Both are suggested to give T square are sub, you know, expected to be T square because, because of the Pauli exclusion principle, you expect the phase space for scattering electrons to be always proportional to the square. But for the same reason that you, some of these electron electron scatterings are vertical processes, some of them horizontal, the two numbers, the two prefactors are not going to be the same. And this has been checked, for example, in this particular case of cerium rhodium indium 5 by Louis Typhers group. You see this is a heavy fermion system which becomes antiferromagnetically ordered and you can measure the T square both in the heat channel and the, in the charge channel and the two slopes are not the same. Okay, up to this is just Fermi liquid transport. One thing, so there is a new angle of attack to wittmann franz law, and this comes from hydrodynamics. So you have probably heard about this during the last couple of years, and I think uh, uh, the next speaker, Sean Hartnell, is going to talk about hydrodynamics more. But let me give you this very, very uh, simple picture. So this is a very now classical paper by Gurzi uh, four decades ago, and uh, you know, it's a very interesting paper, and actually it, is, it reads very well. I would take this out as the main message of the paper, that when we think about transport in metals, we are most of the time, almost always, interested in what relaxes momentum during a collision. The whole uh, Boltzmann picture is based about this, quantifying what happens to a uh, current flow, to have to flow of charge, to a flow of heat, when electrons are scattered and during this scattering, they lose some of their momentum or, or, or the, the energy flow is decayed. But 
This is not what happens when water flows. And we talk about Fermi liquids, but we don't at all look at it the way people in hydrodynamics think about the flow of fluids. Because in, in the case of a liquid, uh, what predominates are momentum conserving uh, collisions. And actually this can happen, so he mentioned two particular cases. Uh, the case of electrons in metals and the case of phonons in insulators. If by some particular process, for example, by making the system very pure, uh, you just abolish any kind of momentum relaxing collisions, then the whole fluid of electrons or, or phonons can drift under the influence of an electric field or a thermal gradient. And in that case, what you expect to see is that the viscosity is going to drive the whole uh, flow picture, which is very, very different from what we see in the case of metals. So, very recently, uh, Andy McKenzie's group in Dresden have seen the, you know, evidence for, uh, sorry, for this uh, kind of behavior in this very pure oxide, palladium uh, cobalt oxygen two, but, and this is one message of my talk, and then we come back to this. This is a very subtle effect. They changed the sample size. So this has been done thanks, thanks to Philip Moll's you know, microstructuring. They changed the sample size by factor of 75. And instead of seeing just a variation which corresponds to the standard Boltzmann theory, they see a difference by a factor of 30%. This is small. This is not a huge effect. Now, very so this is the work done also in Dresden by uh, Claudia Felser and her collaborators. And you see, again, they measured the Wittmann France law this time. So they looked at another system. WP2 is a very pure system. The residual resistivity is very low. Normally, we discuss in micro centimeter. This system has a residual resistivity of the order of four nano -ohm centimeter. The triple R is in five digits. So the mean free pass is extremely large extremely long, and then if you measure thermal conductivity and electrical conductivity, then they found that actually they are violating the wittmann france law. And of course, when she gave this talk, I told her we want to measure that. And uh, actually, even if this paper is not still published, it has created many, many theories about how can hydrodynamics break the wittmann france law. So as experimentalists, we have our own setup you know, the measurements I showed were a two point, two electrode measurement, and you can have thermal resistance of your contacts. They, they can do it because they are working on very small samples. But if we get a regular crystal of WP2 and we use our four electrode setup, one heater, two thermometers, it's a, it's not a, it's a tricky measurement because thermal conductivity becomes very large because electric resistivity, as you see, changes by many orders of magnitude. So it can be measured, and here is the result. Well. That was the result by two contact measurement. And well, the wittmann france law, again, is saved. We find, again, like any other system, that if you go to low enough temperature and you have error bars within 10%, you recover the wittmann france law. But the main message of that paper was not wrong in the sense that the deviation from what you see, well, is not maybe as large as what they are saying, is much larger than anything known. So cerium rhodium indium 5 is a strongly correlated electron system where this deviation downward is driven by electron-electron scattering. This is just a silver wire we measured just to test our setup, and we find basically what other people have found. There is, these two guys both show a deviation less than a half, 40%, 50% uh, maybe here. Here, the, the ratio drops to one-fourth of what you expect at a temperature of order of 10K. Now, what is nice about this system is that we can measure both T cube, sorry, both T square resistivity and T5 resistivity. It, uh, it has a carrier density in the intermediate range where the T square term is large, but it doesn't completely abolish the T5 behavior. So if you do it, you can basically plot your resistivity as a function of T square. You see that at some temperature it deviates upward, and then if you subtract this part, you see that it nicely, uh, follows the T5 uh, behavior. And if you measure your thermal resistivity, basically, you have also a T square behavior, then uh, the upward deviation, but this upward deviation is fitted by a T cube behavior. So we are back in familiar territory. We can quantify these two terms. And the first question is, 
What is strange in this system? Is it electron-electron or is it electron-phono? And the response is, it is actually electron-electron. There is a five-time mismatch between these two prefactors. And so the whole thing becomes, uh, okay, and then we can compare the T5 and the T cube of this system with, let's say, silver. And we see that actually there is a normalization factor, which is, by the way, interesting, because in, in spite of having a Dubai temperature larger than, uh, than noble metals, it's, uh, T, the electron phonon coupling seems to be larger. But it is scaling in the same way for thermal and electrical channel. So, there is nothing particular about heat transport being affected by anomalous electron phonon coupling, but something is fishy about electron electron scattering. Well, this is a semi metal. This is a vile semi metal, if you wish. Uh, it has vile points, but far from your Fermi energy. I don't think it matters at all for the discussion I am going to have here. And the first thing we can say that actually what's happening here is that we have a lot of small angle electron-electron scattering. And you see, this is one of the processes we can imagine. You can imagine an umklap uh, small angle scattering. There are two electrons. One of them is going to suffer an umklap scattering, so it is going to move from one part of the Willmann zone to another one, but the other one is a small Q scattering. And you see, the, whole, the only thing is based on this, that if the collision rate had such a distribution, very much skewed towards small Q, then basically you can explain our results. Now, actually, this kind of experiment has not been done on many systems. We found in all literature, actually, there is an old work on tungsten which beats our record. It is even lower than our case. Both these systems, tungsten, pure tungsten and tungsten diphosphide, are very pure. Look at their residual resistivities. And uh, the other systems, which are not as pure as that, don't show such a strong deviation. So the whole question is, is this something to do with hydrodynamics? I come back to this, or is it basically, again, uh, something that you can explain in, uh, in transport uh, picture? So, uh, Dimitri uh, has a paper which is not yet published, which shows that actually what was suggested in this old paper, that there should be a universal boundary about what B2 divided by A2 can get, is not correct. Actually, you can get this number as as small as you want if you have a very long screening length. So maybe the whole thing is that the screening lengths in different systems are different. Okay, now I try to be more sympathetic to this point of view. Does electron hydrodynamics play any role in this? And at the main message is that we cannot rule it out. And you should bear with me because it's, uh, it's not so anyhow. Don't forget the first message. If there is anything about electron hydrodynamics, it's a subtle discrepancy with the standard picture. And for the moment, in none of the systems I talked about, anybody has calculated either A2 or B2, B2 from first principles. Normally, it should be accessible to theory because we know the Fermi surface in great detail. DFT works and quantum oscillations are there. So normally, this should not be something beyond standard theory. It has not been done and it may be that there is something else. For this, I want you to look or recall, or maybe you, know, you don't know because we are working on metals. We are not familiar with quantum fluids like helium-3. In helium-3, thermal conductivity at first approximation is 1 over T. Viscosity, it's a fluid, is actually behaving like T to the power of minus 2. And actually, if you translate this kind of data into our language, language of people working on electrons, it means that actually the same data can be plotted in this way. The WT, the thermal resistivity, this is basically the inverse of cup over T, is T squared. And this T squared goes up to some temperature and then you have a deviation. And actually you can put helium-3 on the Kadowaki Woods plot. Nobody has done it before, but it does, this is basically electron-electron scattering. Now, the red points here are our B term which is always larger in all system than the A term. But you see that basically this is also electron-electron scattering, but this is, sorry, fermion-fermion scattering, but these are momentum conserving events. These are not momentum relaxing events. So before coming back now to electrons, let me talk a little about for hydrodynamics of phonons, because in this case, actually, I think both the experimental data uh, and, uh, you know, is more, uh, uh, 
is, uh, let's say, wealthier, I have, has a longer history, and the theory is maybe simpler. In the case of phonons, we know that actually you have no electrons to be bothered with if you have an insulator. Basically, the thermal conductivity of an insulator has a peak, and you go through different regimes, and it is possible that you have this regime, first you know, uh, highlighted by Gurzi, which is the Poiseuille regime. Now, this Poiseuille regime has been seen in several insulators, first in helium-3 and helium-4, bismuth, hydrogen, and just during the last year in two different systems where uh, actually the normal scattering between phonons is large enough to see this. So the reason actually doing phonon hydrodynamics experiments is easier than electron hydrodynamics experiments is that uh, in the case of electrons, it is rare or unusual to be ballistic. WP2 or palladium uh, cobalt oxygen are rare examples. In the case of phonons, this is the default case for any good crystalline insulator. So the whole question is, does the uh, uh, Poiseuille regime popping up between the ballistic and the diffusive regime? So here is, for example, the case of strontium titanite. In the case of strontium titanite, between the ballistic regime at low temperature and all these different regimes, we have a narrow region where uh, the ther thermal conductivity is behaving faster than T cube. And this is you know, the symptom you, you can only explain at the moment with the fact that the whole phonon liquid is drifting under the influence of a temperature gradient. Momentum, momentum conserving collisions outweigh momentum relaxing events. Same is true for black phosphorus. Again, we saw this TQ behavior. In both cases, there are reasons to believe normal scattering among phonons is very large. Now, let's come back to before coming back to electrons, let me put it in this way. What we know about the phonons is this. If we, we want to be in this Gurji regime, we should find a region between the ballistic region where what matters most is uh, collisions with boundary and the diffusive regime where what matters most are uh, momentum, uh, sorry, is, uh, yeah, when we go from momentum conserving smaller than momentum relaxing than uh, uh, than uh, top boundary, a region where you have this intermediate hierarchy where uh, momentum relaxing can be neglected, but uh, boundary uh, uh, collision is not also as frequent as momentum conserving events. Now, this gives rise to something which is of the order of 30% rise in thermal conductivity between different systems. Even in solid helium, in regular crystals, you don't see a very drastic effect. It is a very subtle deviation uh, which says that you have an extra contribution to thermal conductivity which cannot be explained in collision-based picture. Just in the same region, people have done second sound. So this is maybe even more compelling than steady state. Second sound means that you send a heat pulse and now the temperature propagates as a wave, not diffusively. As you can see, you can see the ballistic peaks here. And then in this narrow region, there is this second sound peak, which has another velocity. Its velocity is different from ordinary sound. And it vanishes both in the diffusive and in the ballistic region. Now, the question is, can we do these things in metals? So if now I use the data we have, we can build up a region where the Gurzi hierarchy, if you wish, can be uh, accomplished. But first of all, this is a very, very narrow region. Okay, incidentally, it is very close to where we are seeing this minimum in the Lorentz number. But as soon as you change a little the parameters, because what I showed you was based on this idea that our four nano ohm centimeter residual resistivity is uniquely ballistic, which makes sense because the mean free pass actually we get from this number is 140 micrometer and the diameter of the sample is 100 micrometer. But who knows? Actually, we can change this repartition between uh, residual resistivity due to ballistic transport and residual resistivity due to impurity transport by a factor of two. And as you do this, actually the whole window of hydrodynamics closes up. So at the moment, 
If you have a conservative you know, approach, one can say that the deviation from Wittmann Fraud's law can be explained entirely in the Boltzmann picture. On the other hand, since we don't have any kind of quantitative description of our data in the Boltzmann picture, we cannot rule out that the presence of this particular hydrodynamic regime is something which pulls down partially your uh, Lorentz number compared to the Sommerfeld number. I want to finish my talk with saying that, you know, I'm talking about very old subjects. And one of the reasons that I'm not sure that we really understand what's going on, even in the simplest case. So I think most of you know a Fermi liquid should have a T-square resistivity. It has been known since 1937, and it's very simple because, uh, you know, it uh, it's basically comes from argument of Pauli exclusion. The phase space of scattering between electrons should uh, uh, scale with T-square. Now, uh, the problem with this is that if two, two electrons bump to each other and momentum is conserved, it is not clear why there should be any effect on transport. And we tried to highlight this by looking at the case of strontium titanate, where resistivity is T-square. It goes you know, down to very low carrier densities. As you can see, you can, uh, you can change the carrier density by four orders of magnitude. And basically, you see a smooth behavior of this T-square behavior. And you have a region where, as I'm going to tell you in one minute, not, none of the mechanisms we know about momentum relaxation works. Now, this is not particular to strontium titanite. Many of these systems, you know them because they have been considered to be topologically interesting. You can look at the resistivity data, it is T squared. Some of them are compensated, some of them are uncompensated. Some of them allow unclapped scattering, some of them don't. What is funny is that if you just know the Fermi energy of this system, you can guess within the order of magnitude your T squared resistivity prefactor. And the fact is that we know the bubber mechanism, which needs two reservoirs. We need the unclap mechanism. In the case of strontium titanite at low doping, none of them works. Somehow, when you put electrons in a lattice, the lattice taxes any exchange of momentum between electrons. And the reason I'm putting this uh, you know, on the stage is that since the order of magnitude, I showed this Kadawaki Woods region, seems to be within one order of magnitude the same. It is very unlikely for each of them you need one mechanism, the other mechanism. And this is something that I think the chairman of this session has many things to tell about us. He has a very nice review paper about this. But that is my uh, last uh, you know, message. The summary of talk is that, OK, the Wittmann francois at zero temperature, again, is uh, preserved. So another attack to the Wittmann francois at least at zero temperature uh, has been, you know, uh, doesn't work. Uh, it seems to be very robust. Uh, we see a strong departure at finite temperature, and we can identify it is caused by electron electron scattering and not by electron phonon scattering. Qualitatively, this behavior can be explained within the Boltzmann picture just by invoking a lot of small angle low Q scattering between electrons. But we don't have any uh, quantitative handle on that. What comes from maybe this is the most interesting part of this. If you put T squared thermal resistivity, which is there in helium-3, and it should be there in all of these Fermi liquids, you have another handle of the system because you can separate momentum relaxing and momentum conserving collisions between electrons. And this is at the heart of hydrodynamics. And finally, to be optimistic, in this system, like other systems, there is a narrow temperature window where you can actually be in the hydrodynamic regime but marginally. Thank you for your attention.